So Richard <coughs> tells me it's been two and a half years, is that right? Three years. Uh, that he's been working on this aeroplane and uh, he's got it to a state which is very recognisable and without giving too much away, the last photo today shows him sitting in it. Uh, so that's a move, great move. Still a long way from finished, but uh, nevertheless, you can see the progress. Um, okay, Richard, it's over to you. Good day, folks. Um, yeah, that classic state of uh, an aircraft of 80% uh, done, only 80% to go. Um, the previous photo was also one I took at Oshkosh, uh, pictured there is the, uh, the little fella, Trigear Sonics, 1.8 litre VW powered. Just as a little thought, 27,700 US, which is what I paid for it. By the time you freighted it here and gave Mr Swan, who was there at the time, his GST for doing absolutely nothing, so he could waste it on something, uh, it came up to 32 grand. Uh, there's a couple of points about that. One, people keep asking me how much does it cost you, and I say 32 grand, and they say, well, what about all the stuff that you've spent on it since? And I say, oh, yeah, well, consumables mainly. <laughs> and uh, so I'm here to tell you that uh, the price of the aeroplane is 32 grand. When it's finished, it'll cost 32 grand. Uh, I'm not anticipating any more expenditure, at least that's my story, and I'm staying with it. Um, incidentally, uh, I see his face here. Who's responsible? Who's to blame for me doing this? Well, my mum always blamed my dad for telling all those Air Force stories, but that encouraged me to join the ATC. And when I was in the ATC, there was a bloke by the name of Malcolm Yo, and Mal Yo took me for quite a lot of aeroplane rides and uh, well and truly infected me with a flying bug. So if you're looking for somebody to blame, thanks, Mal Yo. It's been a great ride so far. <coughs> um, some appreciations, of course. Uh, I'm a motor mechanic by trade. I'm a sheet metal worker now by experimentation. Uh, people like Jan Andy and John Brown, uh, a couple of ladies who are my go-to advice people, and they do a really, really good job. Um, Murray Corf, not here now. I got, just got a text from him to say that he's busy. I keep telling him to give up work. It's bad for you. Uh, fellow builder, mate of mine for the last 55 years. That's a terrifying thought, isn't it? Uh, any questions, call them out as we go. However, keep it fairly brief because I'm under threat for uh, going over time. By coincidence, as Brian said, yesterday was the third anniversary of the arrival of the kit. And I'm happy to say, that's what it is, there's the main spar in that box there, and uh, on the back of the truck was the, uh, the big box. We actually had to dismantle that and take it off because we had no way of actually lifting it off there, but the, the truck driver was quite nice to it. Um, it was going to take me two and a half years to build this aeroplane. Uh, I can claim a few months for having to catalogue all the parts. Um, so uh, that sort of deflects the next question for people who say, how long is it going to take you to finish it? About that long. Uh, like many builders, I built the tail first. Very proud of my little effort. Uh, since then, I have rebuilt the horizontal tail and the fin and the rudders. Uh, the new ones are much better than the old ones. Uh, building aeroplanes is a process of taking good aluminium and turning it into scrap. Um, this just gets you up to date if you didn't catch the, uh, the time that I was here last time. Once we'd done that, it was time to start the wings. Um, give you a bit of an idea about what's involved. These are the rear spars, and they're made from channel. I think I actually told you the story of these. They're very complex. When you have a look here, you notice that that fitting's on the top, this fitting's on the bottom. There are all sorts of little minor differences between the right and the left spar. We got almost everything right until I discovered I put one of those holes on the wrong side of the line. If I'd 
Knowing what I know today, I would have repaired it, but I didn't know enough then, so away we went, got some more channel and made a new one. However, that was uh, only one of the, the minor little issues. So moving on, we get to the wings. Uh, you'll talk to some people who'll say, the only way to build a home-built aeroplane is to build it from scratch. My reply to those guys is, so what, you go out and dig up the alumina and give it to Alcoa and get them to refine it for you. Um, I never saw any sense in that with respect to those folk. I bought what I could that's actually made and put the rest of it together. There's still an awful lot to do. Uh, the main spar that you can see Murray working on there, putting the ribs on the main spar was reasonably easy because they were both actually pre-drilled, so that was an assembly effort. Uh, but that's quite complex, that, uh, that main spar. When you have a look at it, it's starting to get a little bit uh, better. This is the outer end of the wing. You can see, obviously, the spar gets a bit beefier as you work towards the fuselage, which is the furthest away from the camera. There are quite a few little modifications you have to make to the ribs as they go on from there. There's the rear spar fitted. That was in fact a measure, drill and uh, assemble exercise, so there was a fair bit involved in that. So you can certainly see the wing structure there taking shape. One of the things obviously before you uh, cover up the wings, you've got to put the control pieces in. There's the ailerons there. The little rod ends aren't fitted, but you can see as you look on the right, there's a uh, a reinforcing panel and that attaches to the spar and it also attaches to the wing skin so they're a measure and drill exercise. I got a bit cheeky at this point because um, when I looked at one of the spars it had three holes not with rivets in and that made sense but when I looked at the other one it had all the rivets in and I sent a little missive off to Sonics, and I said, look, what's that about? And I sent plenty of missives off with queries, all of which proved me wrong, but this time it came back and said, yeah, sometimes the riveter gets a bit busy, Richard, and he puts extra ones in. Drill them out, you'll be right. So I thought, good, one for me, about 50 odd to them. Emails and photographs just make life so much easier when you're building. So when I got to the next little point, I was really cheeky now, and I that's a, a dash five rod end on the uh, the left there. And I sent them off and said, hey guys, what are you doing to me? You know, these are dash five rod ends. The, uh, the plans call for dash threes. You've sent me the wrong ones. And a little reply came back and said, Richard, if you read the engineering notes, you know, the ones that the book tells you to read up in the right hand top corner, you will find that you put that little bush in there, press it in, and you've got the equivalent of a dash three in there better. So I pulled my head in and went back to work. <laughs> Again, stuff that you have to put in, these are the pedo and static lines in the ribs. You can see the, um, the corrosion proofing is put on there. Mr. Sonex said 6061 aluminium. Ah, you won't have any problems with corrosion. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not right. So those have all been corrosion proof. There you can see as you look in the top corner some of the little reinforcing and the changes that you have to make to the ribs to fit it there. I did look at that and I wasn't very impressed. So I thought, no, what that really needs is a few little grommets there. So those little grommets, I thought I could buy them locally. They have finished up coming from the US and the people that supplied them still send me emails trying to sell me all sorts of other things. But they were lots, lots cheaper than Clark Rubber, even sending them from the US. <coughs> so you can see there that the rear skin is in place. The front skin is there, but lifted at the moment. The aeroplane does have some really nice little features. The skin is all made for you and drilled. What you have to do is fit the skin and you can tell whether you've got the ribs in the right place because if the holes didn't line up, you made some serious errors. I'm happy to say that was not the case. But we put a black line down the middle of the rib, made sure we positioned them, drilled them, and all that worked out pretty well. 
The skins are in three pieces. There's a flat skin for the top, flat skin for the bottom, and a curved skin for the leading edge. Um, you've got to work on a, a means of pulling that skin down. You can see that, that that wasn't an original idea. A guy in the east suggested this. Get some cargo straps, just ease it down into place. The little gadget you can see sticking up there, quite a few of you are probably well aware of the device called a Clico. It's really a temporary rivet. Uh, the silver ones, there's a couple of them there, are 332. Uh, the goldy coloured ones are 18. And no, they don't speak metric. There it is, looking like a porcupine. Uh, you can see... Don't use that because you muck it up. There's the pedo tube, the pedo static mast right there, and that's attached to those yellow tubes that come back around here. This line here were to first size, all the gold ones are out to final rivet size. Uh, a couple of things that I did do that I'm quite proud of. There's the uh, pedo static mast. You can see that very agricultural bunch of um, washers. I looked at that and thought, nah, you've got to be able to do better than that. Unfortunately, I still get to go out to Carlisle Tech and use some of the machinery, so mine's got really nice little aluminium spaces, better than the factory. That's my story anyway. There's the pedo tube and the static in place. Uh, the pedo's the bottom one, the static. Got a little plug in it there and there's a hole drilled through there to give you static pressure. This is recessed, set down onto there. That's available now as a part. You can buy the pedo assembly. Uh, I would have bought it if it was available at the time, but didn't. There's yours truly riveting. The aeroplane's put together with pop rivets. I like to call them pulled rivets because it sounds better than pop rivets, but the truth is they're pop rivets. The pneumatic rivet gun is absolutely essential because, uh, yeah, you'd finish up with RSI in a serious way if you had to do that. There are literally thousands of rivets holding the thing together. Every now and then, the grandkids come around, so I do some granddad duties. All the grandkids have all set a few rivets in the wing. They all enjoy that and they can point out their rivets. So, yeah, with supervision, Quite fascinating, the, the questions that come up from these kids. I mean, they're only little, but they ask some really interesting questions. And this little bloke can tell his grandmother exactly what a, a Clico is. Don't know that his grandmother cares a lot about what a Clico is, but Riley knows. Flaps and ailerons are next. You might notice there's a fair bit of writing on there uh, with a particularly slashed piece there that says waste. After you cut on the wrong side of the line and destroy an elevator skin and then you have to buy a new one from the USA, surprising how careful you become. There's the, uh, the flaps with a little clutching hand who's the, the mascot of the project and they're ready to be fitted into, into place. Uh, that's Murray and I shifting the wing around. Colin Morrow, who's the uh, lamey very exceptional, talented man, very approachable. He's my mentor from the SAAA who comes over and gives me a tick and every now and says I want every now and then says I want you to do this, this and this. Very, very helpful chap. So there's the wing all finished. Uh, that's the sample. Both of them were finished at that stage. And that's where they're living now. They're in the garage. That's the main spa sitting out this end here. These couple of brackets were knocked up in about 20 minutes by my really good friend John Pittman, who some of you might remember uh, got a few votes from me last time I was in. He did an awful lot of work in setting up things like all the benches and things like that. It pays to have some really good friends and you use them up terribly when you're uh, going to build an aeroplane. It says a lot about his confidence that he's very keen to come for a ride, so I take great comfort from that fact. We moved on to the fuselage. Now here's just a little insight into what's involved. This is just channel work and it just comes as a straight channel. You have to cut it, drill it, put holes in it, 
make the little notches in it. You make all these parts and at that stage you can then put it together. There's the two rear sides of the fuselage, so they're ready for assembly. One of the problems that I had was that you have to have a couple of four inch holes, one about here and one about there. I went to Mr. Bunnings, I incidentally, Sonex assure you that you can build this aeroplane with the tools you have in your shed. Well, my shed's got a hell of a lot more tools than it had when I started. Uh, anyway, off to Bunnings I go to buy a cutter. And I want one of those fly cutters. Oh, no, says the man, they're too dangerous. We don't sell those anymore. But we've got individual cutters. Yeah. So there's the four-inch cutter. And I thought, yeah, that's all right, because I've got a few of the others. And right here is what you need. That's the little center section that screws in there that allows it into the drill. So I went home with my cutter from Bunnings and tried that and it didn't fit. And then when I read the packet, it said you need this centre. So back to Bunnings we went. My mate up in, in the hills, his wife said to me, if John hasn't been to Bunnings for a week, they, they give him a ring just to make sure that he's going to come back because he's really worth it for the profits, me and all. So anyway, I bought that and I screwed it into there and I thought, you little beauty. Um, and then I went to put it in the drill. Well, that's 7 sixteenths of an inch and the drill's 3 eighths. Guess what? Back to Bunnings. So there's the half inch drill that I bought from Bunnings. And I said to Murray, with the way my luck's going, I'll find the drill's three phase and I'll have to rewire the bloody house. <laughs> Fortunately, that didn't happen. So you do that a lot. I spend a bit of time at Bunnings. There's the connection from the rear of the fuselage to the front of the fuselage. These little guys here are actually what holds the whole show together. After you've been building one of these things for a while, you start to respect these tiny little bolts that hold the thing together. When I first looked at it, I thought, gee, because I suppose these are strong enough. As a motor mechanic, I'm used to having big bolts. But anyway, there we are. Some of those had to be bent in various places. You can see there's a piece here, another piece that's vertical, that's horizontal, other way around when they're working there. That's what holds the front to the back. Again, after we put those two together, we go back to the plans and make some more parts. And then you put the parts together and you put the, the bottom on. And so there's the bottom. Uh, Murray is just contemplating all the good that we have done so far. Can I stress, oh, incidentally, there's those four inch holes that gave me all the grief. Uh, it's really, there's a great call for accuracy because what happens next depends a hell of a lot on what you did last time. So there's me, we're pretty happy at this stage because it all worked out precisely to spec. You can see it's just a bit of a triangular box. There's a picture of it. What's really very flash is when you finished it and you look in that hole and you see all of those line up perfectly because that's where the rudder cable's gonna go. And again, if they don't, as the uh, plans advise you, you've got a serious problem. There it is now with all the tail assembly set up there. Uh, there's the two sides all ready to put together. At this stage now there was much discussion about how things are going, where it fits, what the measurements are. And it got to the stage where we'd say as we work through things like this, now you reckon that's right? Yeah, are we ready to drill? Yeah, let's go and have a cup of tea and then we'll measure it again. But at some stage, You've got to fess up and drill it, and uh, I'm happy to say that it worked out pretty well. At that point, what we do is we put the, the little turtle deck on there, two flat pieces just joined together, and they just sit in place. Tucked in uh, just along the side there, you can see that great line of clecos. It's a really back to front process because what we're going to do here is you put that in place first 
And then you start building the internal structure inside. Didn't make any sense at all to me at first until I realised that once you put the, the top on, you had everything pretty well in place. So you continued on from there. There she is all ready to go. At this stage now, it's all firmed up. So, boy, you better have it right. And uh, as long as you've got it right, you can see all that structure for the tail, very, very substantial. It was now ready to go to put the thing together. At that point, you take it off, all apart, and you deburr it, and you sand it, and you paint it. If you're not familiar with deburring, when you drill a hole, there's always a little bit of aluminium around. You've got to clean that off. Now, if you think about the thousands of holes in there, inevitably there's at least two sheets of aluminium. So there's two sides to each of those sheets. So there's 4,000 little deburring tasks. There are some things you get kind of sick of, and deburring is one of them. I notice that Murray has always got something to do when there's some deburring to, done, to be done. At that stage, she's all riveted together. The tail was put on experimentally and we all walked around with big grins because everything fitted just the way they said it should. The front of the fuselage was next, so once again, a zillion parts. Wrong one, Dick. And there is the, uh, the side of the aeroplane with the parts being fitted up. And there it is in place. When you look at the other side, that's all fitted too. If confession is good for the soul, along there is a little piece of metal that's riveted into place. And a few people have said, look, I follow it all, but what's that about? And I say to them, well, that's where you put the X-band radar receiver. That's the special holder for it. But if they press me hard enough, I'll admit that I put something in the wrong place, drilled a set of holes, and had to put a bit of metal there and rivet it in place. Uh, I'm assured by Colin that everybody does something like that, and it'll make it a little bit stronger and a tiny little bit he heavier, but it's a good story that I thought up, which I'm very pleased that he thought so. There it is put in place. Uh, there's the floors in place, all the cross pieces. At that point, we then put the firewall on uh, and the firewall is made of stainless steel and that is a bloody awful material to work with. However, there's only a couple of bits of it there so it all worked pretty well. Looking down from the top, this is the cockpit floor. You can see up the front there is the, the firewall. Just here, this is some of the bracing going into place. That is the wing box the spars will pass through that and meet together and be bolted together. That's part of the coming excitement. There's that same picture, uh, but showing you, it's actually from the other perspective, so now the, the firewall is on the left of the picture. And those are the bits and pieces that you do there. You start to understand how they've always built aeroplanes, at least up until now, and that is to make the parts put them in place, drill them, and cleco them. And I can remember the late Johnny Jansen saying to me, no, no, they're all like that, Richard. They're, you've got to put slot A into tab B, uh, tab A into slot B, and don't you go trying to take it from this one to that one because it doesn't fit. And I understand that. So you, you drill them, you cleco them, and everything's perfect as long as you put things back in the same place. The tail was then put in place and the controls hooked up. What a special moment that was when we put the, the holes in the elevator shaft to pin them together. You know, push pull on the stick, the elevators go backwards and forwards and they're precisely the right spec. When you look at the fin, you look at this and you think, wow, that is really flash looking riveting. Solid rivets, no less. Johnny Brown, who's sad to say isn't here, gave me a hand to bend an angle that was giving me a little bit of trouble. And he looked at the, fin, the fin's frame and he said, Richard, you're not going to put that together with pop rivets. Now, I thought that was a question, but it wasn't. It was a statement. Uh, so with that, he whizzed out the rivets and the rivet gun and he said, I'll show you how it should be put together properly. 
So there it is, folks, a really, really nice little job. John Brown did that riveting. I'm well aware now that if we put the Sonex into a death dive and parts start falling off, the last thing that will fall off is the fin. That's really very well done indeed. If you ever get an invite to Johnny's place, you go and have a look at the RV8 that he is building. Just simply beautiful. And a lot better than that. But that's what he does for a living. There it is put in place. Every now and then, the plans were really, really frustrating. Notice that little gap there? The plan said, make fairing to suit. That's it. And so I'm looking around for dimensions. None. That took a long time. That's about Mark 4 or 5. There are a fair bit of aluminium parts lying under the bench that didn't quite fit. Those ones I'm quite proud of. They fit rather well. So then we put the controls in. They were all connected up. There's the rudder pedals. The rudders are now connected so you can actually whittle the stick and move it around. And there is the seat sling. Now at this stage, the rules of building an aeroplane are quite definite. When you can sit in there and get hold of the stick, you've got to sit in the aeroplane and you're allowed to make your aeroplane noises as you move around. That's where we're up to now. Thanks, folks.